Good morning to the participant in, participants in US, Canada and Brazil. Good afternoon to the European participants and good evening to the audience in Australia. My name is Lene Gerlach and on behalf of Visiofarm I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to the webinar on Assessing Long Structure by Stereology Part 1, Why and How Principles. The webinar is presented by Professor Matthias Ox, Chairman of the Institute of Functional and Applied Anatomy at Hanover Medical School in Germany. The webinar is the first of two webinars on lung stereology and will cover an introduction to the basic principles of design-based stereology with emphasis on its practical application to the lung in the context of experimental studies. The second webinar will focus on examples of applications to animal models of lung diseases and practical aspects. Professor Matthias Ox has many years of experience within the field of stereology and must be termed as one of the key opinion leaders in the field. He has contributed significantly to the dissemination of knowledge and use of stereology, especially, especially within lung uh, research. Prior to his position at Hanover Medical School, Matthias was associate professor at University of Bern, where he held much coveted and well-attended stereology courses. Matthias Ox has been the co-chairman of the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society joint project on quantitative assessment of lung structure from 2007 to 2009. This work resulted in the publication of an official ATS ERS research policy, policy statement in 2010. The principles and recommendations given by Matthias today follow the standards, uh, standards in this policy, policy statement. If you have questions to Matthias during his presentation, you can write them in the question dialog box in a right panel and I will then post the question to Matthias after his talk. And now I will leave the word to Professor Matthias Ox. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, everybody. Um, Thank you very much, Lene, for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm very happy to give this uh, webinar and I would welcome all of you. As Lena already pointed out, uh, we decided to split it into two parts. So today I'm basically talking about general principles of, of stereology as they are relevant for lung research. And in a second webinar, which is then termed part two, I will be more specific about uh, applications, especially to animal models of lung disease. And of course, I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, after this presentation. So the first question we may ask ourselves is whether we can always believe what we see. And optical illusions show us that this is not always the case. And here's one example that shows you two tables and if you compare the tables uh, you wouldn't probably think that they are similar but they are indeed similar in size and shape when we really do the measurements of this table compared to that table. And the point here is that we take these tables as three-dimensional objects although what we really see is two-dimensional um, views or drawings of this table. So what we believe is that the left one extends more into the third dimension than the right one, but uh, this is only the illusion. And this problem of three-dimensionality versus two-dimensionality is also very relevant in microscopy because what we are interested in when we do microscopy is usually three-dimensional objects. But what we have access to in microscopy is basically almost two-dimensional sections. And this sectioning process, either physically or optically by, by any device, significantly affects the available information, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And this is illustrated here. Um, if you, for example, uh, look at dissimilar structures, like these two uh, spheres that are different in size, depending on their uh, position uh, with respect to the sectioning plane, it may happen that they appear as similar uh, structures on the section. And on the other hand, similar structures can also produce dissimilar profiles in the section. If you compare these two uh, particles, for example, which are similar, uh, 
because they also are oriented differently compared to the sectioning plane, they will also produce dissimilar profiles on the section. So we have a change or even a loss of qualitative and quantitative information. And we need to gain this lost information back when we do measurements in microscopy. So let's see why we want to do this when we look at the lung and how we should do this. Um, we should start by thinking about uh, the quantitative structural parameters of the lung that are relevant for the lung's function. And fixed diffusion law, which is shown here, basically tells us that for efficient gas exchange, we should have a surface area of the lung available that should be as large as possible, and a diffusion barrier that needs to be crossed by oxygen molecules that should be as thin as possible. And this is indeed what we find in the human lung. If we look up the textbook data for the surface area of human lung, we find it's almost the size of a single tennis court. And if we compare this with the thickness of the blood gas barrier, which can only be resolved by electron microscopy, we find that it's 50 times thinner than a sheet of airmail paper. But of course the question is, how actually were these numbers obtained? Well, obviously, not directly, because it's simply not possible. But if we could, for example, stick needles into the lung's inner surface, then we could estimate the surface area of the lung, because the number of intersections of the needle with the surface of the lung is proportional to the surface fraction of the lung. And what we can then learn is that the measurement that we actually do to obtain the surface area of the lung is reduced to simple counts, because what we count is the number of intersections. So we can count one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight intersections in that case. So what we actually do is we reduce the measurements to simple counts. For the lung, this principle was basically introduced about 50 years ago by Ewald Weibel, who can be seen here in a photograph from the early 60s. Uh, while he was working in New York with André Cournot and Dickinson Richards, two Nobel Prize holders, and while he was in their lab, they gave him the task that he should do anything on the structure of the lung that is of interest to physiology. And then he teamed up with the Cuban mathematician uh, Domingo Gomez, and they developed the principles and methods that they could then apply to the lung that are now termed lung morphometry. And the idea was that structure is of interest to physiology as long as it is quantitated. So, why should we quantitate or measure lung structure? Because this quantitative information is essential for being able to make statistically valid comparisons. And this can happen at all levels of microscopic resolution, from light microscopy to electron microscopy, even down to the level of uh, single molecules um, in immunoelectron microscopy. And the comparisons are between different groups, and these groups may compare different species or different developmental stages within one group. All the structural data can be correlated with physiological or biochemical data, for example, for structure-function relationships. But in most cases that we experience, uh, it is the comparison between different experimental groups. For example, you have a control group versus a treatment group uh, in an animal model of, of lung disease, for example. Or you have a specific knockout that you want to compare with a wild type. And in these experimental groups, structural data basically make only sense if you have quantitative structural data. So what are useful um, quantitative parameters related to the lung? And if we make a list, as you can see here, from the parameters, they are either three-dimensional, like volume, two-dimensional, like surface area, one-dimensional, like length, or zero-dimensional, like number. These are the basic parameters. And derived from that, if we are interested in the number of particles, we may also be interested in their mean size, which again, of course, is a three-dimensional parameter. And for the lung, as I already explained, barrier thickness is also a very useful parameter, and that again is a one-dimensional length. So for the lung, for example, 
we see that uh, these parameters may all change during normal development, but of course also in disease. Uh, regarding volume, it may be the starting point, total lung volume, or only the volume of the parenchyma within the lung, or only the volume of the septal tissue within the parenchyma, which is basically in the range of 10% only. For surface area, of course, it's the epithelial or the endothelial side of the blood gas barrier, and as you know, this is a parameter that is affected in emphysema, for example. Length, for example, could be interesting uh, regarding blood vessels, capillaries and alveoli, for example, in vascular disorders. The number of alveoli, again, would decrease in emphysema, but it may also be that you're interested in changes at the cellular level, so for example, that have two alveolar epithelial cells, or even their organelles, the lamellar bodies, which uh, contain surfactant, uh, in, are affected in certain surfactant dysfunction disorders. And so, at the cellular level, number and size are important in cases of hyperplasia or hypertrophy, and at the level of organelles, uh, the storage pool, for example, for a secretion product, in that case, surfactant may be of interest. And again, barrier thickness is something that is uh, of interest in fibrosis, for example, the whole septal thickness or only the thickness of the blood air barrier within the septum. And as a start, we could have a look at one example from the literature uh, that was published in, in the year 2000 in the American Journal of Respiratory Cell and Molecular Biology. And the group that published that study was interested in different modes of ventilation of lungs and compared, I think, in red lungs a control group without any ventilation with a group that underwent conventional mechanical ventilation and a group that underwent partial liquid ventilation. The question that was asked was whether the mode of ventilation has any effect on the surfactant producing alveolar type 2 epithelial cells. And so what the group did was they counted the number of profiles of type 2 cells per field of vision under the light microscope. And these are the data that were reported in the study. So around 2 per field of vision in the control group, 0.7 in the group that underwent conventional mechanical ventilation and in the range of 1.5 for the partial liquid ventilation group. And the data for the conventional mechanical ventilation were significantly lower and therefore the conclusion drawn in this study was that there are fewer type 2 cells in this group, obviously because the mode of ventilation injured the type 2 cells so severely that they underwent cell death. So, do you think this is something you would agree to? We could have a look at a similar example, very similar. We look at the number of citizens per square mile of two US cities. We, we compare San Francisco and Los Angeles, and as you can see, San Francisco has significantly more citizens per square mile than Los Angeles. So. Would you, based on this information, conclude that San Francisco has more citizens? Hopefully or probably not, um, basically because you think you need more information. And that's true. You do need more information. You need to know the total area of the two cities in square miles. And if you compare the total area of the two cities, you see that Los Angeles is 10 times larger than San Francisco. And therefore, if you look at the total number of citizens per city, you see that Los Angeles, of course, has more citizens than San Francisco. So, what we can learn from this example is that densities, like number per unit area, number per microscopic field of view, are subject to what is called the reference trap. And you don't want to fall into that reference trap. So quantification may be important in the context of your particular scientific study, but it has to be done properly. And this all starts long before the analysis of microscopic fields. So um, to do proper quantification of lung structure, you actually have to think about it when you do the study design, and in particular when you think of specimen preparation for microscopy, because any quantitative analysis under the microscope significantly or critically depends on uh, proper preparation of the specimen. And for the lung, we have different routes of fixation, like via the airways or via the blood vessels. 
the purpose uh, of the microscopic analysis also influences, of course, the choice of the fixative, uh, whether it is conventional light or electron microscopy or you want to do immunolabelings. And you will most likely never look at the whole lung, but you will look at certain samples, only pieces, small pieces of the lung. And this is a selection process that is very specific to any quantitative analysis. And after that, you do some harsh treatments with post-fixation, with dehydration, and then you finally embed your samples. For light microscopy, mainly in paraffin uh, or glycomethacrylate, and for electron microscopy, for example, in EPON or in uh, uh, novicryl or lumen resins. Then you section your samples, and then you look at them under the microscope, and you do some measurements, which in this case is the second specific step of the quantification. But the important point is, if you're interested in grapes, you do not want to analyze raisins under the microscope. And as you can see, any type of harsh dehydration or embedding, for example, in paraffin, which introduces severe shrinkage, will result in changes in quantitative information in that case. As you can see, for example, the total volume has changed. Interestingly, not the total number in that case. So. For the lung, we do not have a gold standard. There is no perfect physiological lung fixation that fulfills all our needs to do proper quantification of lung structure. But what we have available is some silver standards, as they were termed. And here's one of our silver standards that we use in our lab, which is kind of our routine protocol for the mouse lung. Of course, it depends a little bit on the purpose of the study, and I will go into more details here in the second part the webinar, but if uh, there is no indication against it, we usually use airway installation uh, with a mixture of paraform aldehyde and glutar aldehyde. So our intention is almost always to fix both for light microscopy and for transmission electron microscopy. And in both cases, the samples for light and for electron microscopy undergo post-fixation in osmium tetroxide, block staining in uranyl acetate. And for light microscopy, we do not embed in paraffin. We embed in glycomethacrylate and electron microscopy. We embed in, uh, embed in APON, basically to avoid shrinkage. So this is, I think, a good protocol for, um, for quantification by stereology. The major disadvantage, of course, in that case is um, it does not allow for immunolabelings. And if you're interested in immunolabeling, sometimes you have to do compromises or you have to do a different sampling uh, of some of the slices of the lung for other embedding purposes, for example, which of course is possible. So what should the ideal method of lung quantification offer? It should basically provide you with real three-dimensional data. Again, we, we do look at sections, but we're interested in three-dimensional objects and therefore, we should finally report total values related to a well-defined reference space. In our case, may almost always, uh, always a total lung volume. The data we report should be accurate, so they should be unbiased. And this is illustrated um, in this cartoon here. As you can see, if we think of the bull's eye here as the real, the true value, then, for example, this data set of five independent repetitions of estimates is unbiased because it converges around the bull's eye. This data set is also unbiased because it converges around the bull's eye. This data set does have a bias because it has a systematic deviation from the bull's eye as well as this data set, which is also biased because of this systematic deviation from the true value. Another concept is the concept of precision. Um, precision means if you do the independent repetitions, whether or not these data are very close together, having a low variance, or whether they are having a high variance. And as you can see here, we have a precise data set with a low variance, and here we have an imprecise data set with a high variance. Again, here low variance, and here high variance. So which of the two is more important, accuracy or precision? And the answer can easily be shown by looking at this, because in real life, when you do your experiment and you do your study, you obtain data sets that may either look like this or like that. But what you do not have is the true value, because you don't know the true value, otherwise you wouldn't do the study. So 
Whether or not this data set or this data set is biased cannot be detected from the data because you don't know whether there is a systematic deviation from the bullseye because you don't see the bullseye. And therefore, bias is the big enemy here because the true value is not known and therefore the degree of bias is not known. And even worse, if you think of wanting to decrease any amount of bias by, for example, increasing the number of measurements, in other words, by working harder, this is not possible. Because once there is a bias in the way you do your measurements, it will not be decreased by adding simply more wrong measurements, if you want. On the other hand, precision is not a big problem. Because precision, as you can see from your data sets that you obtain in real life, precision can be checked. You can see that this data set is more precise than that one. And therefore, you can always control the precision of your estimates. And if you think it's necessary in the context of your study, you can increase the precision simply by including more counts, or in other words, by working harder. So we have to talk about bit about terminology because some people call it morphometry, some people call it stereology what they do. And both may be right, they are related to each other but they are not similar. Morphometry is basically the aim. Morphometry is any type of measurement of form, for example obtaining data on volume or surface area or length or number of objects in 3D space, irrespective of the way these data are obtained. For example, if you want to have a tailor-made suit and you go to a tailor and the tailor measures your arm length, then the tailor performs morphometry on you. On the other hand, stereology can be uh, defined as the means to obtain morphometric data, especially in those cases where you are not able to do direct measurements like the tailor. And this is al always the case in microscopy. So stereology is the methods that you should use to obtain morphometric data in microscopy. Although stereology as a methodology is not restricted to microscopy. You can use it with any type of microscopy, but also with any other type of imaging data set you can imagine, of course. The word comes from the Greek term stereos, which is, can be translated as solid or as spatial. There is an international society for stereology. The, the word was also termed about 50 years ago uh, during the first meeting of, of scientists interested in this field. It has a very strong theoretical foundation because it's basically a branch of mathematics. It's, it's applied stochastic geometry. In practice we can define stereology as the science of sampling structures with geometric probes. And this also already indicates the two steps that are related to stereological measurements in microscopy. Because first we have to take a sample and then we do measurements on these samples by applying geometric probes which uh, then introduce or make counts possible. So this is related to the two problems that occur when we want to quantitate structures in microscopy. We, basically cannot look at everything, so we have to take only a few samples out of the whole and therefore we have, and in electron microscopy we have huge reduction in size. But since we are looking at sections, although we are interested in three-dimensional objects, we also have a reduction in dimension. And these two problems can be solved by using stereological methods. Stereology is basically the theory and practice of unbiased sampling. And this is important along all stages of the sampling chain, from the stage where subjects are selected for a particular study, and then tissue blocks are taken from organs from this subject, and then sections are taken from the tissue blocks, and then test fields are taken from the sections, and finally these are used to do measurements on them. And it is important that along all of these stages, the sampling chain has to be complete and not be broken. And it's also essential that what is finally selected or measured is really representative of the whole. The measurements that we obtain should be related to a well-defined and biologically meaningful reference space. And in our case, it's almost always 
the total volume of the lung. The total volume of the lung is in a way the starting point for the analysis because we always like to have access to the whole lung and then measure lung volume and then do the sampling. But it's also the end point for the reporting of the data so you should always report data per lung not per test field or, or whatever you could define because then you avoid the reference trap. The samples that we take from the lung should be randomized with respect to the position in space but also for certain parameters in stereology also for the orientation in space. All parts and all spatial directions when needed need to have an equal chance for being sampled being sampled along a cascade of magnification levels where the phase of interest in one level, for example the parenchyma within the lung, then becomes the reference phase at the next level where, for example, we look at the septal tissue within the parenchyma. And again, the septal tissue with, which is the reference, uh, which is the phase of interest at this level then becomes the reference phase at the next, for example, electron microscopic level and then we can have a look at the type 2 cells within the alveolar septum and then we can calculate everything back, multiply by the total volume of the lung and obtain the total volume for example of type 2 cells really within the lung. There are certain sampling methods for the randomization of position available but there's also of course methods available for randomization of orientation in space if necessary. The randomization in position can be illustrated uh, as shown here, we have an organ in, and that organ is sliced into slices of equal thickness and this is always a good start for a sampling process after you have determined the total volume of the organ for example and in that case we have 13 slices through this organ and for example if we want to select randomly four slices out of these 13 slices one way to do this is termed simple random sampling and we could simply take four random numbers for example number one, number three, number nine and number ten and take these slices for further analysis. That's an unbiased sample but maybe it's not a very precise sample and in order to increase the precision what we could do is perform systematic uniform random sampling and this is shown here. If we have 13 slices and if we know that we want to take four of them what we should do is basically we should take a sampling interval of three and take a random start between one and three and then we have a systematic part which is the sampling interval of three and we have a random part because we have a random start between one and the sampling interval and this is a systematic uniform random set of samples. For example, if we take two as a random number between one and three as shown here in this first row then you see the slices that are selected are slice number two and five and eight and eleven. If we would have taken slice number one by a random number we would have chosen the slices number 1 and 4 and 7 and 10 and 13. But if we would have taken slice number 3 with a random number as a random start then it would have been slices number 3 and 6 and 9 and 12. And this is of course also an unbiased sample in each of the three cases but it's a more precise sample than the simple random sampling. So you decrease the effort um, for obtaining precise measurements if you do this type of sampling. Then there's other terms like stratified sampling uh, in the literature that basically means that you, uh, you define subsets of samples. For example for the lung it could be that each lobe of the lung is, uh, should be selected differently because you want to compare differences between lobes and then you define each lobe as a stratum and then you do the sampling within each of these lobes separately and that's called stratified sampling. Another term that is very important is called the fractionator and that means that you keep track of the sampling fraction that is used for further analysis all along all steps of the sampling chain. In our case here for example each of these systematic uniform random samples represents one-third 
of the whole organ and therefore you know you have a sampling fraction of one third and you can this use for further analysis. So this is about sampling. The second problem that uh, is related to the fact that when analyzing uh, three-dimensional structures by looking at them uh, on nearly two-dimensional sections that we lose one dimension is illustrated here. In, if you compare this as, let's say, a cell and within that cell you have certain organelles and you also have these, these uh, fibrilla structures, you may be interested in the volume or the surface area of the length or the length of these structures, but what you look at if you take one section through this cell looks like this under the electron microscope. So you lose one dimension when you do the analysis under the microscope. And what does this mean? For example, if you're interested in the total volume of these organelles here, and volume is a three-dimensional parameter, these volumes are represented by the two-dimensional areas on the section profiles. So, three-dimensional parameter volume is represented as a two-dimensional area or as two-dimensional areas on the section. If you're interested in the total surface area of these organelles here, which is a two-dimensional parameter, then the surface is represented as one-dimensional boundary lines. So again, you have lost one dimension. Surface area, which is two-dimensional, is represented by the boundaries, which is one-dimensional. If you're interested in the total length of these tubes here in the cell, and length is a one-dimensional parameter, how do they appear on the section as can be seen here? The, these tubules um, appear as zero-dimensional transects. So again, you have lost one dimension. Length is one-dimensional, but the transect is zero-dimensional. So the question, of course, is, so how is number, which is a zero-dimensional parameter in 3D, represented on a two-dimensional thin section if one dimension is lost? And the simple answer is, it isn't represented, it cannot be represented if one dimension is lost. Another way to illustrate this is if you look at this interior of a cell, different organelles of different type, and you take one thin section as indicated here through that cell, then it basically means that the probability for these organelles for being hit by the section, or in other words, for being sampled by the section, depends on their size. Or to be more precise, it depends on their height perpendicular to the section plane. And therefore, the selection of organelles in one thin section is not unbiased, because it's biased towards bigger particles. So in other words, numbers cannot be estimated on single thin histological sections. This can also be demonstrated by this fundamental relationship um, in stereology, telling you that the dimension of the parameter that you're interested in plus the dimension of the test system that you use to estimate that parameter has to equal 3. So if we do this for the stereological parameters, it means that volume, which is a three-dimensional parameter, can be estimated by a set of zero-dimensional test points. So zero-dimensional points feel three-dimensional volume. Surface area, which is a two-dimensional parameter, can be estimated by a set of one-dimensional test lines. So test lines feel surface area. The one-dimensional parameter length can be estimated by using two-dimensional test planes. So test planes feel length. And now we know what the solution for number is. Number, which is a zero-dimensional parameter, can only be estimated by a three-dimensional test system, or in other words, by a test volume. So how is a test volume in microscopy generated if you only have thin histological sections available? Well, the answer is what you need to take is 
two sections from one tissue block with a known distance from each other. And then the area multiplied by the distance creates a test volume. And this basically gave this method its name because you're using two sections. The test volume is termed a die sector. So a die sector is the three-dimensional stereological probe. It was introduced uh, in 1984 in a publication authored by DC Stereo. And if you ever want to look up papers by DC Stereo in the internet, you will find this is his only paper, or hers. And you will also find a footnote on that manuscript telling you that DC Stereo is a nom de plume. So there is no real author with that name, and if you rearrange the characters, you will see it basically means dissector. The paper itself has been cited, I think, more than 1,600 times since its publication. So it's a citation classic in stereology. The dissector is the stereological method for particle counting, and it comes in two versions. There is the physical dissector, which basically means you really have two physical sections from one tissue block, as I have explained to you. But there is another version, which is called the optical dissector, and that can be uh, achieved by focusing through one thick section, for example, by confocal microscopy. The dissector can not only be used for counting, it is also the stereological method for sampling of particles because they are sampled independent of their size. So it's an equal opportunity sampling if you want. And once you have sampled particles independent of their size, you can then apply so-called local stereological measurements uh, for obtaining their mean size. Here is the principle of the dissector explained again. And in that case, we look at a physical dissector. So we have one section that we call the sampling section, which is used for counting. And we have another section, which is called the lookup section, that we use for comparison. And the principle for counting in dissectors is that you count those particles that are present in the sampling section, but not in the lookup section. Or in other words, you do count particle tops that are contained within the volume of the dissector. So the counting event of the dissector is now you see it, now you don't. You see it in one section that is used for sampling or for counting, and you don't see it in the other section which is called the lookup section where you do the comparison. So what can basically be counted in dissectors? It could be that you look at the top of particle, whether it is present in the sampling section and not in the lookup section. But if, for example, you want to count cells and your cells have a unique point within them, like the nucleolus, if they have only one nucleolus per cell, then it may be more convenient to uh, count unique points within the particle, the presence of the nucleolus in the sampling section in that case, but not in the lookup section. And here we have some examples related to the lung. If you want to count alveoli, you use a dissector where you look whether or not an alveolus is open in one section, but not in the other, then it's counted. If you look at, for example, type 2 alveolar epithelial cells, you look for the presence of the nucleolus in one section, but not in the other. And at the level of electron microscopy, you can also use a physical dissector when, for example, you want to count the number of lamella bodies, the surfactant storage organelles within type 2 cells, and you look whether they are sectioned or present in one EM section, but not in the other. So let's summarize so far. We have talked about the parameters that we want to estimate by stereology, which may be volume or surface area or length or number, and how, the, how these parameters appear in two-dimensional thin sections. Volumes appear as areas, surface areas as boundary lines, length as transects, and number doesn't appear at all. We also talked about the stereological probe well, the test system that should be used. So points feel volume, lines feel surface area, planes feel length, and only dissectors test volumes feel number. 
this interaction of the probe with the uh, structure creates counting events and the counting event may be that the test point hits the area, that the test line intersects the boundary line, that the plane transects the longitudinal feature creating transects, or that the dissector volume contains or hits the top of the particles that we want to count. So what we actually measure by counting is the number of test points or the number of intersections or the number of transects or the number of tops in dissectors. And then the computation is very simple. So it's very simple formula that are used, for example, the number of test points hitting the area in 2D or hitting the volume in 3D if you want, divided by the total number of test points, the number of intersections divided by the total length of the test lines, the number of transects divided by the total area of the test planes, or the number of dissector counts divided by the total volume of the dissector. And by this we obtain densities, volume densities, surface densities, length densities or number or numerical densities. But we should not stop with densities because they are subject uh, to the reference trap. These densities need to be converted to total va values or they need to be converted to values per lung by multiplying the densities by the volume of the reference space. We obtain total volume, total surface area, total length or total number. And this is what we should report. So coming back to the initial study that I presented to you, two things were wrong with that study. First problem was that the authors reported densities. Densities per se are not wrong, but their interpretation as total values can be completely misleading because then we have what is called the reference trap. And therefore you should never ever not measure the reference space as Hans-Jürgen Gundersen has termed it. So you have to know your reference space and you should always relate your data to the reference space to obtain total values. Second problem with that study was that the authors reported particle profiles per field of view and particle profiles per field of view is not a measure of the total number of particles in 3D. You have to use a dissector, a three-dimensional test system to obtain numbers in microscopy. It's not possible to obtain numbers on single thin histological sections. So what I've been talking to you so far is methods that are characterized by being free of any assumptions. All the methods do not rely on assumptions on the shape of the structure of interest or the size or the orientation in space or the distribution space. And therefore they are unbiased by design. So sometimes stereology is also referred to as design-based stereology to account for that fact or even unbiased stereology. Although I do not prefer the term unbiased stereology because it, although the stereological methods are unbiased, you can still produce biased data because if, for example, the material you look at under the microscope is shrunken in paraffin, then of course the data do have bias, not related to stereology, but related to the processing of the tissue. So applying stereology means that you apply methods that are unbiased by design, but uh, I would still prefer the more conservative term if you want design-based stereology. So another question that of course is important is how much do I actually need to count we have talked about that we create counts, point counts, intersection counts, transect counts or dissector counts. But how many do I need per lung, for example? Well, two factors contribute to the observed coefficient of variation within a particular study group. One factor is the biological variation between the individuals of that group and that is fixed. Nothing can be done about it. It's nature. So this is the biological signal actually that we want to detect. And the second factor is the coefficient of error due to the stereological sampling principles. Of course because we have estimates and we cannot count everything, we do have a certain coefficient of error that is associated with our stereological estimates and you could 
think of this as the noise within your data. And what you want to achieve is, of course, a signal that is larger than the noise. And you could either express it like this, for example here, so the coefficient of error compared to the total observed coefficient of variation. And this can be calculated which uh, very simply because it's the standard deviation divided by the mean. Should be between 0.2 and 0.5 to be in a reasonable range. And this cartoon shows it also in a different way. So the amount of effort that has to go into stereology to have a low coefficient of error depends on the size of the biological variation in that group. If you have a biological variation that is rather large, like 80%, then you are in a good ballpark if your coefficient of error is in the range of 0.6 or 60%. And then you don't need much or many counts for that. If, on the other hand, you look at a parameter that in a given study group has a low biological variation of about 10%, then your ballpark means that you should achieve a coefficient of error by stereology in the range of let's say 5% and then you simply have to count more. But as you can see this can be checked, there is statistics available for that and you can always keep control of the, uh, of the precision of your estimate and you can always tune the estimate to the precision that you need in the context of your given study. In a typical stereological study the major contribution to the overall observed variability comes from the variability between individuals. And there's also some contribution from the variability between tissue blocks taken from one organ of one subject. And then there is not very significant contributions at the level of sections from tissue blocks or fields of vision from sections or measurements within fields of view. And that tells you something. Um, if you think you need to increase the precision of your study, where should you put the effort in? As you can see, you should put the effort where you have a significant contribution to the overall observed variability. Or in other words, you should do more, but do it less well, as Ewald Weibel has termed it. Do more means invest more into the higher stages of the sampling, by, for example, including more animals per group or maybe more tissue blocks per animal. But it doesn't make sense to do it very well at the final step. So if you use a test system with 10 test points compared to a test system with 1,000 test points on the same number of fields of view, on the same number of sections from the same number of blocks and the same number of individuals, it doesn't help it's almost a waste of time. So if you want to increase the precision, do it where it really pays off and that's by adding individuals per study group or tissue blocks from individuals. You should never start with less than five animals per group because otherwise you risk that there are uh, changes by chance in one direction with a probability of uh, more than five percent and that's something to avoid. And then you should aim as a rule of thumb at around 100 to 200 counting events per individual, per lung in our case. 100 to 200 test points on alveolar septum. 100 to 200 dissector counts of type 2 cells, for example. That usually gives you a precision, a coefficient of error that is good enough in the context of the biological variation that you have in your group. So let's summarize the basics so far. Um, everything in stereology is about sampling and that is really key. Never ever not measure the reference space. You need to know the total lung volume. Bias is the big enemy. Sources of bias are specimen preparation that is not related to stereology but influences of course stereological data. The source of bias may be sampling but that, that is solved by stereology. The source of bias could be if you use assumption-based methods, like based on the assumption that a given cell type looks like a sphere, but that is also solved by using design-based stereology.
A potential source of bias could be observer or recognition bias, but that is not a big problem in stereology because the counts are so easy. So once the observer is blinded to the study group, there's almost no way to cheat because it's very simple to, um, to judge whether a test point falls on alveolar septal tissue or alveolar airspace or whether or not a test line intersects alveolar epithelium or not. So that is very easy and everybody can be trained within 10 minutes basically to do these measurements. Imprecision is usually not a big problem as long as you think of the do more or less well principle. So stereology has a lot to offer. Unbiased and efficient sampling and counting tools. Very simple to apply in practice. Very transparent so you understand what they mean. And very flexible. This is also part of the design based principle so you can always design it to your specific needs in the context of your specific study. And this led many major journals in the field of neurosciences as well as in the field of nephrology to a policy to require design-based stereology for the manuscripts submitted to them. So for the lung, uh, we did a task force project uh, that was uh, initiated by the American Thoracic Society and the European Respiratory Society to set standards for quantitative assessment of lung structure based on the principles of design-based stereology. We did this along meetings over the last years and we had a very nice group of people working with us, um, anatomists, pathologists, physiologists, pulmonologists, radiologists and professional stereologists working with Connie Shah, uh, with Dallas Hyde, Ewald Weibel and myself. And this is the final product. So in 2010 we published the official research policy statement of the ATS and ERS on the standards for quantitative assessment of lung structure. And that was accompanied by uh, several editorials in other uh, journals in the field. So by providing unbiased methods with a high efficiency, the data that can be generated by stereology are valid and reliable. They are real 3D meaningful data that can be generalized and can be compared all over the world at all times. And quantitative assessment by stereology is therefore essential to characterize cell tissue and organ structure or even ultra structure at the EM level, in particular in the lung, in health and disease, and to make statistically valid comparisons between groups. If you want to have further information, I hope you do, <laughs> then of course I can refer you to the literature. Uh, the, in my opinion, the best textbook of stereology is written by Vivian Howard and Matt Reed, termed unbiased stereology. The only thing I would suggest to improve is the title. I would prefer design-based stereology. I think they are currently working on the third edition even. And there's a series of reviews available, but the main paper, of course, is uh, the official ATS ERS guidelines published in uh, the Blue Journal in 2010. And uh, the way I started uh, to do stereology is after I thought it's necessary in the context of my specific research, I attended a stereology course. And if you want to know where courses are offered, you should look up the website of the International Society for Stereology and you will find that there are stereology courses all over the world where uh, people like, like Hans Gundersen or Jens Nüngard or myself, for example, teach the principles and the practice of stereology also on a problem-based approach. So you come with your problem and we try to find a solution for your particular problem. So this is the end of part one of uh, to d the today's webinar and part two later on will then deal with uh, specific applications to animal models of lung disease. But for now I thank you for your attention and as uh, already mentioned by Lene in the beginning, uh, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you Matthias for a very clear and understandable presentation of theological principles. You're really an excellent speaker uh, and I think I'm about to, to get it now. I've been hearing your presentation sometimes and um, Thank you a lot. It was re really, um, I learned a lot and I'm sure that, that our attendees also uh, feel the same way. So now, as uh, Matthias said, you can post questions. You can do it in, at the right panel. There's a dialog box called questions, so you can just type in your questions and then I will post them to Matthias.
but I think I will start out, Matthias. Um, okay. So, um, are there any similar guidelines to the guidelines within uh, the lung research? Uh, are there any similar guidelines for other other organs? Um, not that I know of. Uh, interestingly, not. Of course, there are very, very good reviews in other fields. Um, and these reviews are not, let's say, official guidelines endorsed by uh, scientific societies. But those journals, for example, that I mentioned that uh, then introduced particular editorial policies, sometimes they did it together with uh, review articles. For example, the Journal of the American Society for Nephrology, when they changed uh, their editorial policy in 1999 even, so that's more than 10 years now, they had a very good review on kidney stereology by Jens Nygaard. For the heart, for example, there's also a very good uh, review article in cardiovascular pathology written by Christian Mühlfeld. Um, there's several very good reviews on uh, neurostereology, some by Hans Gundersen or by Bente Packenberg, for example, or by Mark West. Uh, so there is basically the same type of information available, but it's not called an official statement by, by a scientific society. But given the history of stereology, the lung was also the field that in, in a way started stereology because of Ewald Weibel and his interest in quantifying lung structure. So I hope that we are now again in a way uh, leading this uh, and, and other scientific fields will follow. Okay, thank you. And I will then say that uh, Jens Nuengard is uh, holding the next uh, webinar on kidney stereology next week, if anybody is interested. Then there's a question from Jean-Pierre Lavoie. Thank you. This was a great presentation. Can stereology be, be applied for the analysis of lung biop biopsies obtained in living animals where total lung volume is not available? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question and a very important one because after this presentation you must have the impression that whenever you have not access to the whole lung then you're lost. Um, and, and that was in a way not my intention so I'm very, very thankful for this, um, for this question. Of course in the situation when you only have biopsies available there is a certain restriction regarding the sampling. But on the other hand, for example, in human lungs, biopsies is almost always everything you can get. And still it's worth to do proper stereology on biopsies. And we do have a section on biopsies in our guidelines. Um, one point is maybe sometimes you do still have the possibility to estimate the reference volume. If, for example, uh, you do a non-invasive imaging before the biopsy. So, for example, if a patient uh, had a CT of the lung or an experimental animal, for example, had a CT, then the CT data set can be used for a stereological way of estimating reference volume that is termed the Cavalieri principle. It basically means that you need to add the area of all slices and multiply that area by the section thickness. And that is an unbiased estimate of volume. So there are ways of non-invasively estimating lung volume. And then once you have the biopsies, you probably do not have uh, randomized the position of the biopsy so that each part of the lung had the same chance of being selected. That is a restriction that needs to be mentioned simply in your uh, study in the end when you want to report this and publish it. You should simply mention that. You should try to get as many samples as possible because then you do decrease the coefficient of error from the sampling of the tissue blocks. And then of course you could also think of within the sample trying to define let's say an internal reference. Many biopsies in the lung are referred to airway biopsies. So if you sample airways in humans or in experimental animals and you look at these biopsies under the microscope, you, what you could do is you could always express your data to the area of the basement membrane of the epithelium. Of course you 
do have to have in mind that there is some reference trap involved here. But for example, the number of epithelial cells per area of basement membrane or the number of airway smooth muscle cells per uh, area of basement membrane may be very relevant parameters in certain, let's say, asthmatic, for example, diseases. So these are the um, the ideas and, and the uh, yeah the, that we will propose when dealing with biopsies. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, then there are a couple of attendees asking for the slides, and uh, Matthias has agreed to. Uh, that we can send out a PDF uh, version of the of the presentation. So if anyone uh, is interested, then please send me an email, and then I will send you the PDF version of the presentation. Uh, the presentation uh, has been recorded, and is also available on our website by tomorrow. Then a final question from me, uh, Matthias, is that. Everybody knows that time is a huge barrier uh, for many researchers to apply uh, theological methods. So do you have any hints or good advices mm -hmm. of how to optimize the workflow uh, when working with yeah. theology? I know that especially, I mean, it also depends on the research environment uh, that you're in, but I know that uh, limited resources, of course, make this in a very important question. and. So there are several advices I would like to give. The first one is um, plan your study well. In other words, the study design should follow this do more or less well principle. Again, don't think of exhaustively counting test points on single microscopic fields. Think of the influence of uh, the number of animals per group and the number of tissue blocks per animal. So at these levels, even before the microscope, you can do a lot of things to increase the precision or to decrease the variance of your estimates. Second point is you should only aim at the precision that is needed in the context of your study. In other words, if you have changes that are extremely big and you have a biological variation that is extremely high, then it basically means you do not have to count much. And therefore, uh, check the precision that is necessary in the context of the given study. And then at the level of the microscope, there's a few things you can do. One thing, of course, is the generation of fields of view on microscopic sections is something that can be automated. So if you do not want to sit at the microscope for hours and doing, doing it manually. One way would be to use a slide scanner and then the slide scanner can scan all the slides for you overnight, for example, and then in the morning you have it basically ready. And again, there is also stereology software, of course, that can do the generation of the test fields, even of dissectors for you automatically again overnight and you do not have to sit at the microscope, you can do other things and the only thing that is then remaining is you have to do the counts by yourself. But at the level of the microscope there's a lot that uh, automated systems like slide scanners or specific stereology software can do for you. Okay, thank you Matthias again for a very nice presentation. Uh, there's no more question now, so I think yeah, we will thank you and all the participants for uh, taking the time today. Thank you very so. much and bye-bye. Yeah, bye.